while oil prices trading higher currently at $64 per barrel. Achieving macroeconomic stability remains a major challenge for the Nigerian government. The country just recently managed to come out of recession. However, macroeconomic indicators are still looking bearish. Inflation numbers are galloping. The currency continues to depreciate and unemployment rate remains elevated. In the quest to achieve macroeconomic stability, the question many have asked is, where is the role of corporate Nigerians. Now, to have this conversation with us and, of course, react to the outcome of the OPEC Plus meeting is the CEO of Financial Derivatives Company, Mr. Bismarck Rwani. Thank you very much, Mr. Rwani, for being on the show with Great us. Good to have you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Well, let's start with the latest OPEC decision to relax their production. That's despite revising their um, oil demand, global oil demand. Uh, that was just before uh, the meeting. Are you as surprised as other market analysts? Not really. Well, let's understand the structure of the oil markets. One is an oligopo oligopoly, meaning that there are few suppliers and many buyers. Usually the bargaining power is in the hands of the suppliers. How do they do this? They control, they control output, and by so doing, they actually maintain price stability. So what's the situation we have? World oil production is about 92 million barrels. OPEC has only about 35% of total production. So they're not in a strong position. They have now allied with Russia to have what they call the OPEC plus. So what have they done? The Saudi Arabia, as a swing producer and price leader, is producing about 8 to 9 million barrels a day. And so vulnerable countries like Nigeria and Iran, Venezuela, uh, Nigeria is not exempt from production cuts, but Iran and Venezuela are uh, exempted. So what are we going to see, and what you've seen now, is that the global demand gap is about 800,000 barrels. And they are systematically and slowly cutting, bringing back the 1 million barrels, which is actually 6 million barrels below the total balance. So what you're seeing actually is that the producers are taking a cut in production to keep price higher. And that helps countries like Nigeria. But having said that, we have to ask ourselves, today the price is $64 a barrel and our production is about 1.45 million barrels a day. We can get by with that, but definitely there's work to be done. And I want you to understand something. As a fringe player, we have a population of 200 million, and we are producing 1.5 million barrels. Saudi Arabia has a population of 32 million people, and they are producing normally 12 million barrels. Now they are down to 8 million barrels. So if you take barrels per head, we are nowhere near any of these countries. Okay, Mr. Ron, but with this, what are we likely to see in the oil markets in the short to uh, medium term and as regards yes. price level and what will it mean for Nigeria? Well, first of all, oil markets are volatile. Commodity markets are also very volatile. They are political as well as geopolitical and other economic con considerations that determine the price. For Nigeria, we are always happy. Our break-even point Fiscal break-even point is something like 60 to 70 million barrels, 60 to 70 million dollars, 70 dollars a barrel. That means we, we break even and we are what we call a fiscally neutral rate of uh, production. But we are producing 1.4, we are at 60 dollars, we are minimizing our deficit as it were. Now, what it does mean is that the Naira, and uh, the question is what happens to the Naira? What happens to our external reserves? What happens to our revenues? Uh, generally speaking, at this time last year, the price of oil had dropped to $30 a barrel. Now we are 60, we are 100% higher than what it was. So we are in a better place, but not where we want to be. Now, okay, let's look at this. Some analysts and policy you know, makers have blamed the weakness of the Naira and the drop of oil. That was what we saw in 2020. Now, the price of oil has increased by about 35% in this 2021. Year. Yeah, but the Naira has fallen some more in both the IRA window, uh, which is currently um, uh, at um, $400, um, and then the parallel market is now uh, 486 um, uh, uh, Naira per dollar. Now, just before the pandemic, the Naira traded at 360 Naira to the dollar. Uh, that was in the parallel uh, market. In, that was in February. And then the price of Brent fell to about $30 per barrel, briefly. Now, the price of oil trading around 
the 60, 64 barrels per day that we're seeing, 200% higher than the record uh, low. And yet, the Naira has not recovered. Is this case a case that um, the Naira falls when the price of oil falls or vice versa? All right. I think the, it's, it's a paradox mm. that when the price of oil fell, the Naira fell. When the price of oil increased by 200%, the Naira fell some more. So is there a correlation between the price of oil and the value of the Naira? Definitely there is, but it tells you that it may not be a revenue problem but a management problem. Because there's no reason why when the, Naira, when the, dollar, when the oil price was $30 a barrel, you traded at 368. Now it's twice that, three times that amount. That is, it's now 60. So twice that amount. And yet the Naira is at 486. So what's, what's going on here? Policymakers make excuses that the reason why things are bad is because the price of oil has fallen. Now that the price of oil has increased, what's the excuse for not performing? So, the Naira is still falling. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. there's something much more fundamental. The laws of gravity seem to be defied, you know, as far as I know. But would you, would you say the, maybe the government um, profits somehow from devaluing the Naira? In nominal terms, yes. There's what we call money illusion. Because uh, you are getting more Naira per dollar, right? But that Naira can buy only so much, right? But technically speaking, when, you look, when we now look at how government finances have been performing, in spite of the recession, in spite of the contraction in economic activity, government revenues actually increased to a large extent. Why? Because of that illusionary, right? The adjustment of the currency which gives you, which gives you more Naira per dollar. But when you go to the market, international market to buy, that, that, Naira, that, that illusion fades away and you actually have to trade with the dollar or maybe with your Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> That's for Ladi. That, that brings us to the issue of achieving uh, macroeconomic stability and, of course, uh, the role of a corporate Nigeria. I mean, we've seen uh, inflation number. Gallop, we've seen unemployment rate continue to rise, and then we've seen uh, um, uh, the Naira, of course, not stable at all. And so, and some, a lot of people believe that um, some Nigerian companies seem to remain aloof when it comes to, you know, uh, growth yeah. and um, stability. Do you agree with that? Uh, to a limited extent, I do. Uh, but this is what we call a fiscally dominant economy. In other words, government's role is so dominant that you can't do anything without government. And that, is that a good thing? No, it's not a good thing. Because uh, it, it makes business subject to the whims and caprices of political man manipulation. So we have the electoral cycle, we have everything. So even when there are very important issues, all you hear about is 2023 rather than what we're dealing with in 2021. But having said that, you have to ask yourself, what is the size of the Nigerian stock market? It's 20 trillion naira. What is the size of the Nigerian economy? It's 155 trillion naira. You know, we are, at best, we are 10% of 15% of the Nigerian economy is the stock market capitalization. Can corporates do more? The corporates can, can do more because basically, in the end, the investment multiplier is all about, because you increase investment by X, you get a multiple effect of X divided, multiplied by the multiplier. And so we need that. And when we get to talk about what the corporates are doing, the corporates are aloof because you don't want to put your head out there. And they are not cons the policies are not consistent. So people are very cautious. But as time goes on, you begin to see that corporates will have to participate because in the end, it's not the government that will suffer. Everybody will suffer. When night becomes day or day becomes night, everybody's house, everybody's house is covered. Exactly. Well, <laughs> aggregate expenditure on the budget has increased from 7.3 uh, trillion in 2017 every year and consistently to over 13 trillion in uh, 2021. The government has not laid off any employees in spite of uh, two recessions. In the corporate world, we've seen layoffs, redundancies, and uh, force majeures. Uh, are corporate bodies really playing the expected role in the bid to achieving and maintaining uh, macroeconomic stability? Yes, they are. What corporates have to do is to pay their taxes, pay their dividends, employ people, ensure that they do business. But 
when, you, when we had the COVID lockdown and COVID, the palliatives from the government were significantly higher than the palliatives from the private sector. The government also, because of the deficit, the government drew down under the IMF facility, and, uh, borrowed some more money from the World Bank to make sure that the economy didn't crash completely. Yes, we went down to negative six in the second quarter of 2020, but then we, there's been this slight recovery. So uh, to answer your question, yes, the, the private sector also contributed some palliatives, but unfortunately the palliatives were kept in warehouses, which as you know what happened in the yeah, So um, palliatives that are in warehouses do not do anything for the people that are in the houses. I think that's the first thing we have to understand. True. So again, it comes back to the question, do we, have, do we have a revenue problem? Yes, but we have more of a management problem. That's why the palliatives are there. That's why you are struggling to get your national identity what do you call it, NIN. Yeah. That's why you can't, you know, you can see it. It's, it's, it's glaring for everybody to see that there's a management problem in Nigeria. So if you don't solve the management, if, I don't care if you, even if you quadruple the revenue, you will not get the outcome because mm -hmm. the management is bad. If you can't manage one naira, you can't manage one billion. There's a spending problem. There's a yeah, well, there's spending, but management. How, if I give you 100 naira today, and you can't manage it. If, 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 even if I give you 100,000 naira tomorrow, you will mismanage it as well. So you've got to learn how to manage it with the small numbers before you before we challenge you with the bigger numbers. Right, you talked about um, taxation there. Now, looking at the total taxes collected by the FIRS in 2020, that's about 4.95 trillion naira, or about 2.89% of GDP. Now, the tax to GDP ratio in Nigeria is approximately 5%, and this includes state taxes, VAT, and um, so on. Then. IMF would always say that this is low when compared with South Africa, you know, with a ratio of 28.6%. So what do you think can be done to address this low? Okay, first and foremost, you pay taxes on profits. So companies have to be profitable. For, to be profitable, they have to trade profitably. They have to have foreign exchange at market rates. They have to have raw materials. They have to be able to carry their goods to the market without being, you know, harassed and without uh, herdsmen or whatever, you know, logistics problem and security problem. So all of these things put together give you what we can call the return on capital. Now, but if you look at it, total taxes paid, corporate income taxes, no, total taxes collected were about five trillion, but total taxes paid by corporates were about 1.41 trillion in spite of the recession. If the, Earlier we paid, the, first, the year before we paid 1.63 trillion. But if you look at the tax collected, right, you'll find that the top 5% of companies probably pay infinitely more taxes than the bottom of the pyramid. In any case, they make the bulk of the profit. So, like they say, many are called, few are chosen. Unto him who has more shall be given, well, and unto him who has more. I want you yeah. to hold your thoughts uh, yeah. there because it will be interesting to get to you know, know exactly what these corporates, some of these corporates, perhaps the big ones, what they really pay in taxes, taxes if we can really sure. track yeah. that. So we'll continue with this um, conversation. Mr. Rwane is still here with us. And of course, we would also do a quick review of a fixed income market. After the break, do stay with us. Thank you for staying tuned. You're still watching Business Morning on channels of television where we're still looking at um, the role of corporate Nigerians in achieving macroeconomic stability. And we we'll still have here the CEO of Financial Derivatives Company, Mr. Bismarck Rwane. Thank you very much, Mr. Rwane, for sticking on. Thank you. Yes, you were talking about, we're talking about uh, the low tax ratio of Nigeria, but it's important to know what some of these um, top companies actually paying taxes. You did mention that they pay a lot of, you know, taxes. What are these companies, who are, who are these companies that pay these taxes? And if they have to pay so much in taxes, and then we are not even seeing what the, the government, impact. yes, the impact, impact. Mm. of it. Should it be a case of where perhaps they don't have to pay this much and then channel it into infrastructure development as a private sector? Okay, let me take first and foremost, total taxes paid by corporates in Nigeria was 1.4 trillion. But the top five companies by market capitalization on the stock exchange themselves paid 302 billion. In other words, they paid about 22% of the total taxes, five. 
That's why I say many are called, few are chosen. Mm -hmm. Now, but let us look at these companies. The highest paying tax body in this country, corporate, was Dangote Cement, paid 97 billion naira. It was followed by MTN, which paid 93 billion naira. Airtel Africa paid 83 billion naira. Nestle paid 21.4. Ambua paid 6.53 billion naira. Of course, remember you paid taxes on profits earned, mm. and after writing your allowances and you know capital uh, capital allowances, right? So that's what what happens, you know. But uh, essentially, um, these guys. But it's not only tax they pay, but they paid all oh, three hundred two billion naira. And for you to understand it, the total budget of Oshun State, for example, is for the year is fifty billion naira, right? And that's what they get. That's the total allocation they get, fifty billion naira. This company, Dangote alone, pays tax twice the total value of what Oshun State gets for the year. So I just want you to, uh, to imagine what it is. Uh, you said, you made, made the point about how much paying tax is one thing, but how much value did people get? Mm -hmm. What are the proceeds of tax? Yes, again, it comes back to the management problem. But let us understand something. There's this new concept of tax for asset conversion. The Dangote Group actually had tax for road conversion, right? So you not only, because if I pay tax and the money is stolen, if I pay tax and the money leaks, then people don't get anything. But if I convert my tax, part of my tax, into an asset, the people can feel the impact, especially if it's a critically social, critical social infrastructure. Mm. The question now is how do you value it, right? So, but it, it actually mitigates the risk of diversion, and the people can feel it. So if I say I'm going to, I'm going to fix the fourth mainland bridge with taxes rather than wait for taxes to be paid and contractors to be paid and uh, you know kickbacks all and all process. of that. You may get that particular. So a tax for asset conversion program can be useful, but it also can be abused by unscrupulous people. So it's but you're a member of the advisory council, so perhaps you can advise the government to uh, look at this means of developing infrastructure you see, uh, we don't advise on television. <laughs> we advise in camera. I'm just so, saying. All right. So, <laughs> so okay. in, in this uh, context, how would you explain how much corporate social responsibility activities of some of these um, uh, companies in impacting the less privileged and the bottom of the economic pyramid, pyramid in Nigeria? Yeah, uh, very good point. The thing is that it's not just taxes they pay. Uh, for example, these five companies, the dividend they paid last year was 559 billion naira. So if I add dividend, which they paid to Nigerian shareholders, to taxes they paid, so the, the injection into the economy is quite significant. It's over a trillion naira for these five companies alone. And then if you, if you now look at uh, what they do, for example, uh, you take uh, Dangote, uh, in, in particular, right? Mm. It's, uh, let me first of all step back a little bit. These five companies account for 68% of total market capitalization. They contribute 302 billion naira of taxes. Their profit after tax is 691 billion. And total dividend paid is 559 billion. But unfortunately, direct employ employment is only about 25,000 people for these five companies. Mm. 0 0.04, but that's direct employment. Indirect employment is that if MTN is, has 60 million subscribers and you're using your phones to settle transactions, your peers, they are creating employment in terms of productivity. Dangote cement is used for affordable housing, for roads, you know, so it, the indirect impact of this, the activities of these profitable companies, apart from just employment, shareholders withholding tax on their dividends and all of that, go a long way to ensuring that the impact is felt and the people feel. And that way, they complement the activities of government. And I cannot under, un, underestimate that impact in terms of what it does. Because in the end, if people, even if you make money and they are not employed, if they are not employed, they become restless. When they become restless, 
they, they become dysfunctional. Mm. When they become dysfunctional, then you and I cannot sleep at night because the poor, when the poor are hungry, Eat right? The rich. The, rich can, <laughs> the, poor, the poor are angry because they are hungry, mm -hmm. but the rich are, are kept awake because the poor cannot sleep. Mm. Okay. Now, we just um, heard the federal government talking about a supplementary budget. budget. Um, and of course, um, getting um, 396 billion are, you know, for COVID vaccine. And you know, some people believe that um, perhaps the private sector have really not done much in, in that area. Do you think that's a fair criticism? I don't think so. If there's only so much that the private sector can do. And there's so much the government, but it's, it's, it's a joint effort. But let me tell you something. In, in 2020, in the last 20 years, there have been hardly any supplementary budget. In 2020 alone, we had three supplementary budgets because there's kind of uh, there's a tacit cooperation between the legislature and the executive this time. So the price of oil went down, they slashed the budget. The price of oil went up a little bit, increased the budget, and then we had some borrowings and we increased the budget. This year, 400 billion naira for vaccines. We need that. We need the vaccines like yesterday, right? And so, but do we need to have a supplementary budget because of 400 billion, we are in a budget of 13 trillion? I'm not so sure, but just for, to fulfill our righteousness and decency, the government will do that and go through that. But then the private sector has to play its role. These vaccines are there. We've, I think in all, we've vaccinated uh, less than maybe 500,000 people in 29 days uh, out of the 4 million vaccines. So again, management problems, you know, uh, that, that's very important to understand. Yeah, I also want to take you back to that issue of um, taxation because I was just thinking, you talked about, you did mention MTN, I mean companies that pay huge taxes that are listed on the exchange, MTN, Nigeria, uh, Dangote. Yes. Um, we didn't get to hear any of the banks and yet they are posting mm, some true. stellar uh, Again, okay, tax, there's what we call taxable income and income. So even if you make income and you make a profit and it's not taxable, then you will not be assessed on that. The first thing is that every investment in treasury bills is not taxable. So if you have a big bank, a tier one bank, that has a balance sheet of which 30 to 40% of its assets are in treasury bills, all of the revenue on those treasury bills are not taxable. So even though it makes 200, I think somebody made about 200 billion naira profit, right? But paid tax of only about 5 billion naira. Why? Because all of the revenue from treasury bills is considered tax-free. Not only that, even if they buy treasury bills on your behalf, they will take that revenue as their revenue and therefore they will get tax exemption on that. So it's... Um, Oh, it's, an, it's a very interesting thing to look at. <laughs> All right, before we, we let you go there, of course, we're talking about um, AFCFTA, which uh, we have ratified. And which Nigerian companies do you think are, you know, positioned to reap the benefit of the AFCFTA? Well, first and foremost, those who will reap the benefit are those who are positioned ahead and then those who are responding. So let me put it clearly. UBA is a Nigerian bank with 20 had a UB Africa strategy before, after, and everything. So you must give it to Tony Elumilu that he was proactive. Then the Dangote Group are in 10 to 14 African countries. Huge investment. Mm -hmm. Of course, help is uh, Helen Ayama was here the other day, flying within the region and flying across the continent. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to understand that those companies, because they have, they are, they have a source of competitive advantage, are going to be able to benefit from this lower tariff across Africa. Don't forget that Africa has 1.2 billion people. Mm. Uh, so they, this is a major, major market. So uh, you are not going to, be, going to be a Nigerian giant, you're going to be an African giant. Nigeria is the largest economy in Sub-Saharan Africa. 25% of, roughly, approximately 25% of total GDP in Africa is Nigerian. One in four, Niger one in four Africans is a Nigerian. Mm. So I think that it's a very important thing to understand. So, Again, you, you know, if I may end up there, I would say that you have the MTN Foundation doing significant amount of work across Africa, right? Mm -hmm. And especially in Nigeria as well. The Dangote Foundation is doing so much work. IDPs, they're doing things in, in, in business school in the University of Baden, Premier University. You uh, have uh, boreholes in uh, Kano. 
And there's so many things to be done, but that's important. That's giving back to, the society. to, to society. So first of all, you're making money, you're employing people, you're swapping some of your tax for impactful, tangible assets. Mm -hmm. Then also, you're actually uh, having, helping the charities to reach out to people. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rwane. Always so a much. pleasure talking to you. And um, happy holiday. This is happy Good holidays. Friday. <laughs> happy Good, good Friday. Friday. Make sure you eat your fridge on.